בעזרת השם, נעשה ונצליח. I want to welcome you to another session of the Beacon Town and Lush and Learn as we continue our learning of Prashat HaShavua. This week, Prashat HaShavua is Chayet Before we get started, I'd like to give an honorable mention to our sponsors, H&M, Bil- the Joseph Dornbrush and the Dornbrush family with H&M Builders. Um, also, Judah Mendel from Mendel Law, the sh- long-time sponsors of, uh, of this class. Hashem v'echotchem, s'amechotchem, and be'ezrat Hashem, b'sorot tovot, v'chom ha'se'edechem. Also, we have a brand new sponsor, Coastal Financial, a good friend of mine, Mr. Lira Zamora, uh, a, a life insurance uh, guru. Anybody who uh, needs some life insurance, please contact me so I can put you together with a very, very sophisticated gentleman who really knows what he's doing in that field. Uh, before we get started, I also like to uh, dedicate this class to the Ilu Nishmat of David ben Zohara, Shmuel ben Amuma, Yaniv ben Rina, Tzion ben Zechari, Abraham and Freddy ben Moshe, Daniel ben Juna, and Miriam ben Simi, as well as Reuven Israel ben Tisteh and Yeshua ben Ben Esther. Also, this class has a lot to do with Zivugim. So, Be'ezat Hashem, Yitbarach Shemo Shal Kadosh Baruch Hu, that the following people will have a tremendous amount of success in their, in finding their soulmate. In Val Bar Jaklin, Bat Chem Bar Jaklin, Yehuda Lev Be Mendel, Stacy Esther Bat Miriam. And for general success, um, Shashem Varech, Jonathan Moshe and Julia Rimi, Shalom and Eliyahu Ben Stis Yester, Abraham Ben Violet Chaya, and Ariel Ben Yael. Okay, let's get started. So, after a successful 10th test for Abraham Avinu, which is the Akedah, Akedah Titzchak, Abraham Avinu is ready to go home. He's ready to go to his wife. He's ready to go to Sarah and tell her the good news that he passed the final test that Hashem had for him, that uh, Yitzchak is on his way to the yeshiva of Shem and Ever that he's going to learn, or, you know, as the Midrash was telling us, that he was up in the heavens at this time. And as he's coming back to deliver the good news, Abraham finds out that Sarah passed away. And if we want to get a little bit of background of how that's possible, you know, uh, some rabbis would like to say that this was the hardest test. Imagine, you just finished the 10th test, you feel that's it, Hashem is not going to test me anymore, and you come home to a dead wife. It's not so easy, it's not so uh, simple for that to happen. But the Midrash tells us on how that happened. The Yetzirah was unsuccessful at um, deterring Avraham from his Akedat Yitzchak. The Midrash brings that he kept trying to speak to him. He came to him in, uh, as different characters, as an old man, as a young man. He put a huge river in front of him that Avraham Avinu still undeterred, walked all the way till it reached his nostrils and then he turned to the Hashem and said, I can only go this far. And then the river disappeared. He tried so much in order to make Abraham fail on his 10th on his tenth trial. And when he saw that he couldn't do it, he decided to go to Sarah. The Yetzirah went to Sarah and he starts a conversation with her. Where is your son Yitzchak? So she tells him, he left to study the law of sacrifices with his father. Because uh, the night before, not the night before, but a few days before when Abraham Avinu was trying to uh, convince Sarah that it's time for him to go, he didn't tell her, God told me to, to put Abraham, hey, Yitzchak, uh, uh, bring him as a sacrifice on Hara Moria. He, that's not his, how he's going to present her only child, uh, the, what he's going to do is only child to Sarah. So what he told her, he said, I think it's time for the child to learn Torah. He should go to the yeshiva of Shem and Heve, you know, learn the Torah. He's already 37 years old. He needs to get married. You know, maybe we should do that. And she agreed with him. She actually agreed to him going to the yeshiva. And that entire night, she was completely distraught 
she was yelling, uh, she was crying. Not only was she crying, she spent time with him. She be safe, take care of yourself. You know, I'm always here for you. You know what? Okay, so let's pick it up where we left off. So, as he convinces her to allow him to take his son to the yeshiva of Shem and Ever, then, <laughs> then the Yetzirah tells her, well, Isaac is not going to the yeshiva to learn how to uh, to learn the laws of sacrifice, Yitzchak is the sacrifice. And she tells him, uh, that cannot be. However, since a, a, a mother worries about her children, she left where she was, and she traveled from Be'er Sheva to Hebron. And over there, Hebron, in Kiryat Arba, this place called Kiryat Arba, meaning like the area of the four, Rashi tells us that it was Kiryat Arba. The reason why it's called Kiryat Arba is because there were four giants that lived there. Their name was Achimai, Shashai, Vetalmai, Ve'avihem, and their father. So she goes to these giants and she tells them, stand up straight, take a look. Do you see a father and a son on a mountain? And they say, yes, we do. And as they see what's going on over there, it says, we see the father holding a knife to the throat of, uh, of, the, of the child, and he's about to shecht him. And as soon as she heard that, nishmata, and she passes away. Now, even though Yitzchak, or Akedat Yitzchak, was the tenth and final test of Avraham Avinu, coming home to a dead wife was the continuation plot of the Yetzirah. Because should he come home to a dead wife after the 10th trial, what would happen? Avraham would regret the Akedah. He says, I should have never done it. Why did I do this to my wife? Why did I do this to my dear Sarah, this Tzedeket? How could I put her through this? She died from just thinking that of oh, what I was going to do. Had she known that it was just me placing him on the altar, I wasn't really going to shaft him. He would have had a remorse, regret for the Akedah. Also, because of him uh, regretting that, it would undermine all the previous tests. And they'll say, oh, you see, Abraham, look at the last test. He, did, he, he, he regretted everything that he did. All the 10 tests, he regretted it because, look, he lost his wife. He regretted every single test that Jim put him through. They said, I had a very, very deep plot going over here to get Abraham Avinu. And that's why the parasha begins with these Pesukim. Sarah lived to 127 years old. She died in Kiryat Arba in Hebron. And now we know why she died over there and not in Be'er Sheva where he left her. Be'eretz Kenan. And we see that Abraham came to eulogize Sarah and Livkota and bewail her to cry for her. Over here, we have to make a distinction. If you look in your uh, Chumashim, uh, or if you look in the Sefer Torah, you're going to see that the word Velif Kota, to cry for her or to wail for her, uh, the Chaf is very small. So in other words, you have the, the Vav Lamet Bet big, a small Chaf, and then a Taf and a He. And the reason why there's a small Chaf is to show us that, Hashem, that Avraham Avinu cried a little bit. He didn't cry a lot. Why? One, so people won't say, oh look, he's regretting his final test. Look how much he's crying for the wife that he lost because of Akedat Yitzchak. So he cried only a little bit. Also, he knew she was going to a good place. She's going to Gan Eden. <laughs> She's in the, it's an upgrade from where she was. So, uh, that small half signifies that he cried just a little bit for those two reasons. As a, as a matter of fact, it says also that Avraham Avinu, it says in, later on in the parasha, Avraham Bakol. 
that Hashem, later on the parasha, will revisit this pasuk again, but I just wanted to throw it in here. It says, Vayvarech Hashem et Avram bakol. Hashem blessed Avram Avinu with everything. Bakol, with everything. Our rabbis tell us, Rashi tells us actually on the spot, Bakol is Gematria 52. Gematria 52 meaning Ben. Meaning that he blessed him with a son. Okay? Why would that be that he blessed him with a son? If you listen to last week's, parasha, eh, last week's class, we understood that Yitzhak Avinu was challenged. He had a neshama that could not bear children. So he had to go all the way to the heavens to get a rewiring of sorts in order for him to get that neshama de ducha, not neshama de nukba, neshama de ducha. This neshama de ducha will allow him to now bear children. So, so when it says Vayvarech Hashem Tavam Bakol, meaning now he's a boy, now he's a son, now he's going to be able to bear children. But uh, another opinion is that he had a daughter, and her name is Bekol. That her name was Bekol. So Avraham had a daughter and a son. Now, if you go back to this pasuk and it says, and Avraham Avraham Yispod Desara Velif Kota. Remember, that small chaf, if we eliminate it, and we just read the words that are left over, it says, Lispod de Sarah ulevita, meaning in her daughter. It says that her daughter, Sarah, and her daughter died on the same day. So it was like a double whammy to see that him and his, his wife and his daughter passed away on the same day. That it was a big challenge for him. But he cried just a little bit because he knew it was for the best. Now, Abraham finds himself right now in Hebron, this place called Hebron. And he's in search of Ephron, looking to purchase a specific field, a specific cave called Me'arat HaMachpelah. So again, you have to, you know, you have to say, either he knows the place really well, and he knows the, the real estate and what he wants to buy, or he knows something that we all don't know. Why was Abraham in Hebron specifically and looking for this specific Marat HaMachpelah? Why this specific place? And how did he even know about this exact spot? Oh, you mean Ephron, the one who owns this uh, spot in Hebron. I want to speak to him. You know, it's like uh, if you're an out-of-towner, you don't exactly know every nook and cranny of the, of the city or the state. So if we go to Peg Chet, I'm sorry, if we go to Peg Chav Gimel, but now we read the Pesukim Chet and Tet. It says, Vaydaber itam lemor, im yashav nachem, im yash, Avraham Avinu is talking to the townspeople. Im yashet nafshechen nikbor et metim lefanai, shema'uni ufiguli be'efron ben tzokha. If there is anybody over here uh, uh, who knows Efron, please call him over here because I need to bury my dead. Vayten li et Ma'arat HaMachpelah. He says, and give me this place called Ma'arat HaMachpelah. Ma'ara is a cave. Machpelah is like a double cave. Asher lo b'kce sadeo. And that is in the edge of his field. Bechesef male itenel ali betochem lachuzat ha-kev. And I pay full price for it in order to bury my dead. Now, this is very interesting. In order to understand this pasuk, that Abraham Avinu was asking to specifically this field and this cave, we have to go to last week's parasha to understand what's going on over here. In last week's parasha, in Perik Yud Chet, Parashat Vayera, Perik Yud Chet on Pasuk Zayin, if you recall, Abraham Avinu had guests. He had the three angels. And Abraham Avinu is doing Achnasat Orchim. And the Achnasat Orchim that he's doing right now is he's going to take three cows, shech them, just to get their tongues so you can give it on a plate with mustard to each angel to eat. Imagine, the, imagine, one cow is enough to feed a village. 
he's willing to do three for the Hachnasat Ruchim. In other words, imagine a, 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 you're a guest of someone who will do absolutely, give you the best of the best of the best that he has for you. And for every person that comes through that door. Imagine. So on Perik Yud Chet Pasuk Zayin, it says, I'm sorry, Pasuk Zayin, Ve'en ha-bakar at Avraham. Ve'ikach ben bakar rach v'tov v'ten anav v'mayr asot oto. So while he's shechting two cows, one of them runs away. And Avraham Avinu chases this cow or this calf. It says, Ve'en ha-bakar ratz Avraham. Now, as he's chasing this bakar, as he's chasing this animal, it leads him to where? To Marat HaMachpelah. He sees this place. The first time that Abraham Avinu sees Marat Amachpela that is in Hebron. Just to think about it, if he was in Be'er Sheva, that's a long jog. But again, you know, who knows what's going on over there behind the scenes. So Abraham Avinu, he gets led to this Mara. First thing that he sees as he goes in there, he notices that there's a smell. And the smell is, uh, you know, the smell of heaven. It's such a beautiful smell. It's such an intense smell that it makes a very big impression on him. He goes inside and who does he see? He sees a candle. He sees a candle and besides the candle, he sees Adam and Chava. As a matter of fact, he's, not only does he see Adam and Chava, that are in this cave, but he sees the heels of Adam uh, Arushon, and they say that the heels, the Akavayim Shel Adam, they were brighter than the sun. Meaning the heels of Adam were so bright, he, he was so, uh, uh, I say, luminescent, that his, his neshama, his body, was shining brighter than the sun. And when he saw this, he says, you know what? I want this for myself. He realized that Adam and Chava are buried over there. He says, you know what? This is when the time comes that, uh, that he needs to get buried, his wife needs to get buried, or you know already, Abraham, it's Hagbi Yaakov, this is going to be the spot. So this is the first time that we see that Abraham found out about Marat HaMachparaz when he's running after the Ratz Achar HaBakar. Ve'el HaBakar Ratz Avraham. Now, there's another reason why he ran to Marat HaMachpelah. And this is also in the following Pesukim. In Pesuk Yud, to Yudalet, it says, When the angels came to tell Abraham Avinu the news that Sarai Men was going to be pregnant, it says, We'll be back here in about a year, and you're going to see that your wife is going to be pregnant, she's going to have a child. Sarah is listening in, and she's hearing the news that the angels are giving Abraham Avinu. They're old people. Abraham is 99, Sarah is 89 at this point. She started to, she stopped having the, the manner of a woman, the, 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 the menstrual cycle that women end at a certain point. Sarah was, was way past that at this age. <coughs> and Sarah started to laugh. And she says, It says, I don't have the way of a younger woman. And my husband is an old man. She's laughing. <laughs> How could this be? Hashem comes to Abraham Avinu and asks him, Lama zetzachka Sarah lemor ha'af umna meled v'ni zakanti? Why did Sarah laugh, not thinking that she's going to be able to uh, uh, bear children because she's old? From here we learn that you're allowed to change the truth a little bit for Shlom Bayit. Because what did she say? She said, Adoni zaken, Abraham is old. When Kadosh Baruch Hu reports to Abraham, what does she say? He says, Vani Zakanti. She said, she's old. He changed it in order to keep Shlom Bayit. 
but we see over here that Sarah laughed at the news that she's going to bear children. Now, Lama Zitzachka Sarah Lemor, because she laughed, something happened over here. The angels came to deliver news of the Neshamot, the souls that Hashem is going to grant them. And the Neshamot that they were supposed to receive Abraham and Sarah was a result of a boy and a girl. They were supposed to have a boy and a girl. But before, but because she laughed, what happened? Abraham still had the schut for a boy, so there was Yitzhak. But the schut for the girl, because of her laugh, went away, and that neshama started to go back up, up to the heavens. But what's the route of a neshama that comes down to go back to the heavens? The neshama had to go through me'arat ha'machpelah. Now. Which neshama did they lose? Which girl was supposed to be born to them? So, the, so Abraham ran after, ran after that neshama. It says, Abraham ras el habakar, right? It says, don't read it el habakar. Read the word habakar. It's the same letters as rifka, el rifka. The neshama of Rivka was supposed to come down at that exact same moment, and she was supposed to be his wife too. But what happened? They lost it. So what did Abraham go? He went all the way over there, and he started to pray in Ma'arat Machpela for the neshama to come down. Why? Because that's the right neshama for his son. So we see over there that Abraham Avinu prayed for the zivug of his son, in Marat HaMachpelah. And who is it? Ratz El Habakar. Not Ratz El Habakar. Ratz El Rivka, the Neshama of Rivka, that had to go there. Now, why specifically Marat HaMachpelah? So here we need to get a little bit more history to understand what's going on with this location. Marat HaMachpelah is the gateway to all the Neshamot that are coming and leaving this world. When a neshama comes to this world, first it's from the heavens, goes through Hebron, Me'arat HaMachpelah, and then it goes into a person. Similarly, when a, when a neshama passes away and needs to go to the Shemaim, what's the, the, the route, what's the highway? It has to go all the way to Israel, all the way to Hebron, it has to go through Me'arat HaMachpelah, and then it goes up to the Shemaim. It's the gateway for the neshama to come up and down in the world. Similarly is the, just to, you know, to, 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 make you, to make you see it also differently in a different way, there is uh, the Bet HaMikdash, right? If you ever wonder where your tefillot go, it has to go, for your, you know, the Kavanah is always that my prayer is going from here to Israel, to Jerusalem, to Bet HaMikdash, to Kodesh HaKodeshim, and then there between the two... Uh, Kiruvim, it goes up to the Shemaim. And similarly, when a person's answer, uh, tefillot are answered, it comes, that's the, the pipe, of the, 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 the pipeline of all the, 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 uh, all the berachot that come from the heavens, goes through the same channel, goes through Harabait Bet HaMikdash. But for the Neshamot, it's Me'arat HaMachpelah. Now, this exact same cave is also a gateway to all the Shiduchim. Because when the neshama comes down from the heavens, where does it have to go from? So we know, I mean, we've, we've spoken about it uh, many times, about how neshamots are formed. So there is one neshama, uh, male and female, in the shamayim together. Sometimes they come down together at the exact same time, and each one goes their own separate way, and they some way hope to meet together later on when, they, when it's time to get married. Or sometimes they come down at different times. Some come down a year before, 10 years later. It's Avinu. He was 37 years old and the neshama of his, of his uh, soulmate has not, been, uh, has not come down yet. Why? He wasn't wired to have one. He couldn't have children. So on, uh, on Akedat Yitzhak, when, uh, when Avraham Avinu uh, nicked of uh, Yitzhak a little bit, and and they say that his soul, his neshama left him, 
He went to the heavens and he was there for three years. But at that exact same moment, as soon as, uh, as Yitzhak Avinu was in the Shamaim and they started to rewire the Neshama, at that exact same moment, Rivka started to, went down from the heavens through Me'arat HaMachpelah and became a child. And that's why when, uh, when Yitzhak Avinu came down from the heavens, he was 40 and she was 3. Because that's exactly at the time that his Shiduch came down and they were able to get married. So it's a gateway to all the Shiduchim as well. So we see that Abraham Avinu, knowing this, went, all, he sees, here's Adam and Chava, the first Shiduch that Hashem made in the world. He went over there and started to pray for Rivka, for Yitzchak Avinu. There's a few more layers to this story, but before we get into the layers of the story, let's understand a little bit more about Marat HaMachpelah. Why is it called HaMachpelah? Again, you got to take the word He HaMachpelah. What's HaMachpelah? So there's a He in the front and a He at the end. HaMachpelah, right? So there's two He's. And the word Mechapel, double. What's double? So here it's a little bit of a you know, deep concept. We know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu created the world uh, created the world with the letter He and created the heavens with the letter Yud, whatever that means, okay? But Ma'arat HaMachpela, it says it has two He's. What? It has the He of this world over here, the physical world, and it has another He for the spiritual side of this world. Okay? Ma'arat So, we have, uh, in the world of Shev, we have, you know, Ila'a and Tata'a. There's the higher realm and there's the lower realm. So this Machpela had the ability for someone to access the higher realm and the lower realm all in that place. Why? Because, because this Me'ara is called Me'arat well, you know, on a Pshat level, on a Pshat level, the reason why it's called Me'arat HaMachpela, even if, you are, if, somebody, if a kid asks you, why is it called Me'arat HaMachpela? It's, simple, it's simply because the cave has two caves. The Gemara talks whether it's one on top of the other, one and one that's behind it, but basically it's got these two, uh, this, these double caves, four of them. One, two, three, four. So because there are these double caves, it's called Marat HaMachpela, because it comes in, uh, in doubles. But Marat HaMachpela, if you want to know a little bit more about it, when Chava passed away, Adam needed to bury her. And when he was looking to bury her, he went to that exact same spot and he saw a very, very thin light shining on that field. And he was very attracted to that light. And he went over there, when he went over there, he started to smell the smell of heaven. He says, I know this smell. This is the guard, this, this is the gun Eden that I, was got, I got kicked out of. So he started in that place, he started to dig. He started to dig. And, and the Midrash says that he's the one that actually built the Me'ara. And while he's building it, they told him, stop. You, you, you're digging too much. You might cross over to the other side. Meaning, if he kept digging, he'd be able to get to where? To Gan Eden. He was told to stop digging so he wouldn't make an entrance into Gan Eden. Marat HaMachpela is the entrance to Gan Eden in this world. Imagine this place this, that we're visiting, it's a tourist site. You go a little bit too deep on that, you're on the other side, there's Gan Eden. Now, since they are prohibited from going back to Gan Eden, Adam buried her at the entrance of Gan Eden and he prepared for himself also a burial place. Now, when Abraham saw Adam and Chava when he came to bury Sarah, something very interesting, hap interesting happened with Adam and Chava. They got up and they started to walk away. They were very, very embarrassed of being around uh, Abraham and the dead Sarah. 
So Raham stops Adam and Chava saying, you know, why, uh, you know, why are you uh, feeling uncomfortable? So they said, we're walking away because we're embarrassed of our actions. So we brought death to the world. And here you're coming and bringing your righteous wife to bury her. She died because of us. So he said, also, when you come over here and you're burying Sagai men or the Tzadiket over here, you know, compared to us, uh, we feel, or, or so compared to Chava, she says, I brought death to the world. And what has she done? She just d done amazing things. I feel embarrassed. So they felt like they, they didn't belong in that place. The presence of Avraham and Sarah made Adam and Chava uncomfortable. Now, Avraham assured Shvila you know, Pinchas actually brings the whole conversation. But I, I'll just read you the last part. Avraham tells Adam Arishon, he says, He says, I'm going to make the, an utmost effort in, in, for you and for your wife that you won't feel embarrassed in the upper heavens because we are here. In other words, he's going to help fix what Adam, what the Chet Adam Arishon, the first sin. Now, That calmed down Adam, but Chava wasn't, she still didn't feel comfortable. So Avraham Avinu also calmed her down and told her that he's going to do the utmost to do a tikkun for everyone. And then he buried Chava again, and then he buried Sarah. Now, remember in the beginning of the Pasha, we said, that we are, that Abraham, that Sarah went to Kiryat Arba in Hebron. We said that the reason why it's called Kiryat Arba is because of the four giants that were living there. But now we're going to learn it differently. Who are the four giants that are in Hebron? It's Adam and Chava, Abraham and Sarah, it's Yitzchak and Rivka, and it's Yaakov and Leah. Those are the four giants that are living in Hebron. As a matter of fact, and I think we said this in our previous class, but I'll just throw this in there because it's just so interesting. In Sefer Devarim, I'm, se I'm uh, sorry. In Sefer Devarim, there's a hint to somebody else that's buried over there. Somebody else is buried in Marat Machpela. It says... In Perklamed Aleph, Pasuk Tet Zayin. When Moshe Rabbeinu passes away, it says, Vayomer Hashem el Moshe. Hashem tells Moshe, He necha shochem v'mabotecha. You're going to go lie with your forefathers. Who are the forefathers? Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. When he tells them it's time to, to you know, to, uh, it's been 120 years, it's time for you to go up to the mountain, it's time for you to, uh, uh, to, to appoint Yoshua, and Hidcha, Shochevi Mabotecha. And here you are going to be uh, laying with your forefathers. The only forefathers that we know are in Israel. He's in the desert. What does that mean? Now, if you go to this week's parasha, to Perk Chav Gimel, Pasuk Yutet, it says, V'achrechen kava Abraham etzah ishto, that Abraham buried Sarah ishto, el me'arat sede ha-machpela. In me'arat ha-machpela, that is in the field, right? Which, by the way, Gan Eden in Sefer Bereshit is also called in the sadeh. So we see that what is this Sadeh? Is this the Sadeh of, uh, of, of the first Gan Eden? We'll touch that in a second. But just right here, if you take the first letters, the Rashi Tevot of Me'arat Sadeh HaMachpelah, Mem Shin 
Hey, Moshe. And I've seen even a picture that shows that he's not in those cubbies, but there's some sort of a tunnel to where he is. And him and Miriam, no, I'm sorry, him and Miriam, him and Tzipora are buried together and that it's connected to Marat HaMachpela. Let's just throw it in there as uh, extra information, as a bonus. So why is it called Marat HaMachpela? Because there's couples over there. Why is it? Also. Also. And why is it Kiryat Arba? Why is it called Kiryat Arba? Because we have the four couples that live over there. Now we know that all the souls, all the Neshamot, pass through Marat HaMachpela. And we know that when they come to Ma'arat HaMachpela, they get stopped. By who? By Adam HaRishon. And what does he tell them? He says, uh, before you're let into Gan Eden, before you go through this route, through this channel, they check his neshama, and he says if it was a proper neshama, they allow it entry. If not, they refuse it entry. Zacha nichnas, lo zacha, lo nichnas. He has to go to a different route. So, in other words, not every neshama gets to come back through that route. They all come down through that route, but they don't come back through that route. Similarly, is the zivugim that we said that the neshamot are coming down, and the zivugim come from there, meaning the husband comes down and the wife comes down. Sometimes at the same time, sometimes at different times. It all depends when. Sometimes also when uh, you go to some rabbis that are very much in tune and they ask for uh, a bracha. They say, oh, give me a bracha for a zivug. And they see that it's not there. Why? She's still married. She didn't get divorced. She wasn't born yet. Well, you know, they know. Sometimes they give brachot easily, easily. But then they say, oh, you should have bracha for a zivug. They don't like to give bracha for nothing. They picked up that the zivug right now is, uh, you know, let's say... Uh, being held by somebody or uh, is not available yet or has not become available whatever it is sometimes when the rabbis don't bless they also understand that the neshama itself has not come down and the zivug is not available okay now that we know this thing about this background about let's go back to our story what was Abraham doing by so we know that Abraham is chesed and Yitzchak, he is the complete opposite. He's Gvura, right? So we have, uh, you know, loving kindness and strict judgment, right? So we know that in marriages, opposites attract. They have to have a balance. You can't have too much chesed. You can't have too much deen. One has to be chesed, one has to be deen. Typically, the woman is deen and the man is chesed. That's how the books, the, the books would bring it. Probably with some exceptions. But basically, since Yitzchak is Gevurah, since Yitzchak is Din, he needs the complete opposite in order to balance him out. He needs Chesed. Who is Chesed? Avraham Avinu is Chesed. So Avraham Avinu begins to pray that the, 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 uh, the Neshama of Rivka, or the, let's call it the Neshama of the Zivu of, uh, of Yitzchak Avinu should be from the side of Chesed. And as a matter of fact, we see this clearly that when Abraham Avinu sent his uh, servant at Yezir, he saw, how did he know that, his, that Hashem made, it, made him successful? He says, oh, I succeeded in my journey. Why? Because the first thing that she started to do, chesed. Do you want water? Water for your camels? Water for yourself? He's like, oh, for sure, this is the one. She's filled with chesed. But when Abraham was able... Abraham, we see that he was able to, in Akedat Yitzchak, he was able to control both Din and Chesed. Even though that he's famous for being Ava Chesed, but we see that he was also able to do something that is completely strict judgment, hold a knife to his son's throat, ready to do Akedat. So that means that Abraham Avinu was a master of both Chesed and Din, which means that what? Sarah is not needed anymore. She was the one balancing him out. But now he's balanced on his own. He doesn't need to do it. So what happened at that moment? Job done. Her mission is complete and she was able to go. Not necessarily, well, 
for several reasons. One, it's hard for several reasons. Put it this way. We look how we can learn out Akedat Yitzhak through the experience of Sarah, the Kafsrut, it's a good thing. Why? When they picked her up, or when they told her that Akedat Yitzhak, well, well, there's one opinion that they picked her up on the hand and they showed her Akedat Yitzhak, there's another opinion that there was a vision, there's another opinion that she was told, regardless, she knew there was the Akedat. So you know what she said? She said, if my husband is, has gone to the point that whatever Hashem tells him, he's willing to do, including shut his own son. And if my son is gone to the point that if Hashem told his father to tie him up or bring him up to the altar, and he is agreeing to it, he's stretching out his neck, my job is done over here. I've done my job as a wife, and I've done my job as a mother. And she was ready to go. That's another kafzchut way of learning it out. Now, Yitzhak, who was Dean, needed Rivka, who was from the side of Chesed, in order to balance them out. So when Abraham prayed El Habakar, not El Habakar, he prayed for El Rivka. He prayed for Rivka. That for what? For the Neshama of Rivka to be Chesed, to balance out Yitzhak. In other words, Abraham Avinu, the man of Chesed, know exactly what type of uh, uh, neshama his wife needs to be. Now, the soul, the neshama of Rivka, was given birth or came to fruition by Abraham. How? You see that Sarah's death was the birth of Rivka. It's almost as if like in the same moment that she died, Rivka came into this world. As if there was an exchange. They couldn't be here at the same time. Why? Because she laughed. If she didn't laugh, they would have been able to be there at the same time. But because of that, the punishment was that you have to go out and she comes in. You were the Chesed to Avraham. No, sorry. You were the Dean to Avraham. She's going to be the Chesed to Yitzchak. I got introduced. Uh, through these classes to a great person. His name is Ari. Became a very good friend of mine. He's not living in Israel. So proud of him. He's been listening to our classes and ever since then he's gone higher and higher and higher and higher in his learning. And he shares a lot of classes with me. He shared with me a class about Akedat Yitzhak that is mind-blowing. Uh, Rabbi Yoshua uh, Rubenstein, I believe who shared this Hidush about Kedushat Levi. Now, all this is just to bring Mashiach closer, right? And it says over there something incredible. In Midrash Kedushat Levi, which I happened to open up the book today and I saw it for myself, it says over there that when, in last week's parasha, when it tells us the lineage of the people that were, uh, were born in the house of Abraham says, Right? It says that Betuel had a child, her name was Rivka. Later on it says, That Rivka was uh, not, it's not Nolda. Proper Hebrew would be Nolda. She was born to him. Yuleda. Lebetuel, something is off with the grammar, something is off with the language. It's not the right word. So Kedushat Levi says that she wasn't Betuel's handiwork. Meaning, rather, she was the product of Avraham Avinu. How? It says, why is this, does it say that it's Yuleda Lebetuel? She was uh, 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 an offspring or, uh, or, or a child or was born with or to Betuel, not necessarily his child. It says, Yulda le Betuel, 
If you take the word Betuel, the name of her father, is that she is the Bat El. She's the daughter of God. And we know in God's names, we have the name Elohim. Elohim is a name of strict judgment. But sometimes we see Elohim shortened into El, right? Like uh, El Noralila, El Noralila, the word El. What's El? It's God's name of strict judgment, Elohim, but the Chesed version of it. So Bat El, she's the daughter of Chesed. Who is Chesed? Abraham. Abraham is the father of Chesed. He's the one that gave birth to her. In other words, Abraham was heavily invested in the neshama of Rivka. Later on, it says, Abraham zakin ba bayamim, Hashem berach et Abraham bakol. That Abraham came to a ripe old age, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu blessed Abraham with everything. Meaning he had wealth, he had... Uh, uh, you know, he, he had a full life. Everything that a person could wish for, Avraham Avinu got it. So before we said Bakol, two explanations. Either Bakol, Bet is 2, Chaf is 20, and Lamed is 30, all together is 52, meaning he was blessed with a child, with a Ben. Or her name was Bekol, a daughter that was Bekol. Now that we've learned everything that we've learned up until now, that we know that the Ben that he got, I'm sorry, the, 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 the daughter that he got, Shema Bekol, that her name was Bekol. We know that this Bekol, we just learned it that she died with Sarah, but it's very easily can also be learned out that she was in the Shema of Rivka. What was that daughter that he, uh, that he merited to? It was that he had part in the Neshama of Rivka. Secondly, in Herk Hafhei, the Suki Utet, says in next week's parasha, the opening line to parasha Toldot, it says, Ve'ele Toldot Yitzchak ben Avraham, Avraham holid et Yitzchak. What a cryptic uh, pasuk. These are the offsprings of Yitzchak, the son of Avraham. Avraham uh, gave birth to Yitzchak. Ele Toldot Yitzchak ben Avraham. Okay, you want to let me know that Yitzchak is the son of Avraham. Because there was a rumor that it was the son of Avimelech with Sarah. Okay, we, we brushed off that rumor. So the Torah is letting us know, just in case, just know that Yitzchak was the son of Abraham. The second part, Avraham holided Yitzchak. Abraham gave birth to Yitzchak. How is that possible? It is possible. Because when he shechted him and that Yitzchak, when he, and the Neshama went up to the Shemaim and got the rewiring of a Neshama, the Duchra, and that Neshama, the Nukba, he gave him birth. He became a new person. So he did give birth to Yitzhak. So we see that Abraham was heavily invested in Yitzhak and Rivka. In conclusion, why is Ma'arat HaMachpela specifically in the city of Hebron? Couldn't have been anywhere else. Why is the, the, the gateway to heaven, the gateway to Gan Eden, the, the, the gateway to the Neshamot, specifically in the city called Hebron. So, if you take the word Hebron, it comes from the root word of Mechaber, to connect. And what are we connecting over here? That area, that grave site over there, is a connection between Olam Hazeh and Olam Abba. It's a connection between Gan Eden Tachton and Gan Eden Elyon. That's the hay here and the hay that's on top. It's the connection of the Zivugim. So a Zivug is a connection. Where do you go to pray for connection? Kiryat Abba. Why? Why did he go to Kiryat Abba? Because over there, there's couples, only couples. <laughs> Who's buried there? Couples. Who goes there? Anybody wants to become a couple? And where do you go over there? El, el, el Habakar. We said, what Habakar? Avraham Avinu says, I know for Zivugim, there's only one place. Marat HaMachpela, let me pray for Rivka. El Rivka. As a matter of fact, this, this city of Hebron has such a strong 
uh, spiritual energy for connecting and for uniting is that even David HaMelech, when he reigned as a king for 40 years, seven of those years he lived in Hebron. And 33 he ruled in Jerusalem. Why would he spend seven years in Hebron? Because he needed the Itchaber, he needed his own connection with Abraham, with Yitzhak, and with Yaakov. Why? Because he's the fourth leg in the chariot. He's the fourth leg. He's the fourth. We, we have the, the, the uh, Arba uh, Raglota Kiseh, right? Arba Raglota Merkava. Who are they? Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Who's the fourth one that we're waiting for? David, David, Mashiach. So he says, hey, I, I can't be Mashiach if I don't connect to Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. So he stayed in Hebron for seven years. That's the power of that city. That's the power of that place. The opening to Gan Eden. The opening to Gan Eden is in Hebron. Now, if that's the case, then heaven is on earth. Heaven is on earth. And if you want to know where it is, we can map it out. We can map it out. If you map out the four rivers coming out of Gan Eden, Sefer Bereshit, Parashat Bereshit, lets us know that Nahar Perat, Nahar Pishon, Nahar Gichon, and Nahar Chidekel, four different rivers, are coming out of Gan Eden, and Gan Eden is in the center of it. If you go to a map, we know which one is Pishon. Pishon is the, is the Nile, the Nilus. And we know which one is Perat. And we know which one is Chidek and Gihon. If you map it out, if you go to a map and you say, okay, here's the first river, here's the second, here's the third, here's the fourth, what's smack in the middle? Where is Gan Eden? Israel. Israel is Gan Eden. The only thing is, when we are there in the right way, it reveals itself. It opens up. It becomes Gan Eden. But when not, it conceals itself. And we have to, we don't, we don't see it for what it is. Am Eretz Yisrael is Gan Eden. And the gateway to it is in Hebron. Where? Where is the door? Marat HaMachpelah. So this spiritual and supernatural portal is right there in Hebron. It's where the Neshamot descend to the world and start and merit to go back. Not only is it the entrance to Gan Eden, but it's a place for prayer, especially for Shiduch. And it's a place, and it's a big part of our history and our heritage. A few Pesukim in the, in the parasha are letting us know a little bit about where Abraham buried Sarah and we move on to the rest of the story. But underneath it, look what's happening. Neshamot, Zivugim, the entrance to Gan Eden, everything. Incredible. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Thank you for getting the Torah out there. And there's a shame that we merit to, to see Gan Eden, heaven on earth, Bim Hera, Amen.